The border city of El Paso, Texas, used to have extremely high rates of violent crime, one of the highest in the entire country, and considered one of our nation's most dangerous cities. Now, immediately upon its building, with a powerful barrier in place, El Paso is one of the safest cities President Trump is set to hold a rally on Monday in El Paso, Texas. The announcement coming a day after he made that false claim about the city in his State of the Union address. A fact check by the El Paso Times shows that the crime rate in the city decreased before the fencing was constructed. The sheriff of El Paso has dis also disputed the president's claim, saying the city was safe before any wall was built. Adding that Trump continues to give a false narrative about a great city. Joining us now, member of both the House Judiciary Committee and the House Armed Services Committee's Democratic Congresswoman Veronica Escobar of Texas. Her district represents El Paso. And before joining Congress, she was the county administrator, uh, uh, county commissioner, county commissioner and county judge for El Paso County. Also with us, former chief of staff at the CIA and Department of Defense, now an NBC News national security analyst, Jeremy Bash. USA Today opinion columnist and former senior advisor for the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Kurt Bardella, and senior resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund and an MSNBC national security analyst, Dr. Evelyn Farkas is back with us. So, Congresswoman, let's start with setting the record straight about El Paso. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss that we have a president that uses the State of the Union to spread lies and to make up things to back up his, his I guess, political platform for 2020. How do you help El Paso set the record straight? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you. Uh, this is part of it. Um, okay. and, and I'll tell you, it's really unfortunate that that communities like mine have to spend time talking about what we are not instead of talking about what we are. El Paso is and always has been a safe community, one of the safest in the country. We are also an important component of the national economy because we are a key artery for trade between right. uh, the United States and Mexico. We have really been at the forefront of dealing in a very humane, compassionate way with the almost five years of Central American asylum seekers who are arriving at our front step. Um, you know, I, th you mentioned that the president is coming to El Paso, and I've worked really hard to try to invite as many people to come to the community as possible. Mm -hmm. And today, the president will receive a letter from my office, uh, number one, asking him to correct the record and tell the country the truth about El Paso and the border. Number two, asking that he apologize to my community. And number three, if he's go going to come to El Paso on Monday, that he truly take the time to see the community in its entirety. What he will find is that, yes, we have a fence, but Felipe Alonso Gomez, the eight-year-old boy from Guatemala who died in U.S. custody, was apprehended in El Paso where we have a fence. Mm -hmm. So he will see that fences don't prevent asylum seekers. If he uh, provided us with the time, we would show him the ports of entry so that he could see the need for modern technology and personnel there. When the president mentioned this in his State of the Union, what went through your mind, given all <laughs> your experience, you've lived, you've served in El Paso? I mean, I, I, I just would have been speechless. Uh, I, well, I wasn't speechless, but Good. it was a, a very troubling moment for yeah. me. You know, the, I, I think part of what he was trying to do, uh, and it really just came to me after the speech, he had to say that we were one of the most dangerous cities in America, again, which is a lie. Wow. And he had to say that so that he could prove his point, which is border communities and immigrant communities are inherently bad places, which is not true. To acknowledge that we've always been safe would be to acknowledge that border communities are mm -hmm. actually vibrant, thriving, safe, secure parts of America. Okay, so Kurt Bardell, I'm going to ask you to uh, comment on all the subpoenas being prepared by the multiple committees. You worked on oversight, spokesman for the House Oversight Committee, Evelyn and Jeremy, you can follow up. Of uh, all the questions being raised, which ones stand out to you? What are you looking at in terms well, of oversight? I think what we're seeing right now is 
As we saw in the State of the Union address, the yeah. president flagrantly lies about everything. It's hard to keep up with. But now we finally have a mechanism, a check and balance, to fact check him, to use congressional authority to get the facts. When he says something about what's going on at the border, we have investigative tools to get those answers. When he says the administration is going to do something or isn't doing something. But it's dizzying. How do they focus? And what stands out to you about the questions being raised right now? Well, I think we Most tomorrow ones. we're going to have the acting AG, Matt Whitaker, there under oath, and he's going to have to answer questions about his role in the Russia and the Mueller probe. He's going to have to answer whether or not he's been talking with Trump about it, whether he's been obstructing it in any way. We need to know what this administration is doing to stop investigations, and we're going to get to the bottom of that. Jeremy Bash, of the questions being raised, are we getting closer to not being shocked and actually having an understanding of what's happening? Well, I think we're really just at the beginning here, and over the last week, you've seen the various chairmen of the House committees unveil their oversight plans for the coming Congress. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to take some time. And a question I have for the Congresswoman, which is, how will you do oversight over, for example, the deployment of troops to the border? Because this, I, I've been in the exactly. Pentagon this week. Yeah. I served in the Pentagon. I was there this week. And you see a lot of personnel, a lot of Army personnel, focused resolutely not on the terrorist threat in Syria or issues about Korea preparing for the summit and the, the regional implications of a, of a potential deal with North Korea. You see them focusing on deploying troops to El Paso, to the border. How will you do that oversight? So we just had a hearing uh, in the House Armed Services Committee about this, troops on the border. We spent many hours sitting in that committee room, and we never heard what we learned later that night through the media, which is that the administration was planning on sending more troops to mm. the border. We, um, it, From my perspective, it is obviously a misuse of resources. Readiness is the number one goal. It should be the number one goal. This undermines our ability to be ready and prepared. It, I think it's very bad for morale. You know, in all of the president's um, uh, speeches and through all his rhetoric about what's happening on the border with asylum seekers and refugees, we've never once heard him address how we're going to deal with this from a long-term perspective. Never has there been a detailed plan about how we will deal with the countries in the Northern Triangle. The, instead, it's a misuse of resources, a wall, troops at the border. Evelyn. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about, Congresswoman, because I think it's clear that the president wants to paint this picture that the wall is the solution. He wants $5 billion. We're approaching $1 billion for the troop deployment. And as you said, our intelligence community, our generals and admirals have said the threat is China and Russia. We shouldn't be focused on concertina wire on the border. That doesn't help them get ready for those threats. You mentioned Central America, the countries downrange, if you will, where these people are coming from. What should we do? What do you think? What's a good comprehensive policy and a better use for that money? So we need a short-term plan and a long-term plan. Over the long term, we need sustained investment and leadership and accountability there. It, our money needs to be spent wisely. We need to be on top of that every step of the way. But it's going to take leadership, and it's going to mm -hmm. take leadership from the top. I have yet to see that. I don't think that the president wants to necessarily stop Central American refugees. He, the, the wall, if we take a step back, you know, he had two years to get he this did. done. He did. He his, his party had All an power, iron right? grip on the House, the Senate, the White House. They didn't get it done. But somehow we're to believe that it's an emergency. The, the only emergency <laughs> that exists is the president wants to deliver on a campaign plan. Oh, we've right. got an emergency. <laughs> right, right. But that's not at his wall. Um, Willie Geist. Hey, Congressman. It's Willie Geist in New York. Good to see you this morning. I want to just ask you, I, hopefully you have a leading voice in this conversation within the House, given your experience and given the mm -hmm. district you represent, about what's going to happen in this deal over immigration. The president wants the wall. Nancy Pelosi says no money for the wall. Democrats have talked about smarter technology along the wall. Do you believe there should be some concession from the Democratic side, just based on what you know about what happens on the border, that maybe parts of a wall, as Customs and Border Patrol have requested, should be built a couple of hundred miles instead of the big wall that President Trump is looking for? 
I don't, Willie, and, and here's the issue for me. We, we have to be smart with our resources, and our, th that's a lot of money. I have been talking to Border Patrol agents and Customs agents on the ground, and in the rural area, there is definitely a need for, for the Normandy-type uh, barrier that they've always used. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with that is, so that, that is for the wide open spaces where cars and trucks are coming through. That's, that's really what the Normandy barriers are for. Totally support that. That's always been the case. That's been in past funding, uh, continuing resolutions. The wall is not going to stop Central American asylum seekers. And here's why. And if you came to El Paso, I would show you that the wall is not actually built on the U.S.-Mexico border. It's in some cases built several yards away or miles away. When Central American refugees either get dropped off by coyotes because they can no longer, asylum seekers can no longer seek asylum through our ports they're being prevented so they're now being dropped off in rural areas they're walking across mm. coming up to border patrol agents mm. um, they're asking for help they're not running from our agents they're running to our agents a wall does nothing to stop that so we've got to ask ourselves what is the real goal here our goal, and, and I am with um, our, our uh, uh, DHS folks when they say we've got to know who's coming into our country, we've got to have safe, secure communities. I live on the border. I want a safe, secure community. We are one. We have been. But we've got to do it in an intelligent way. And one last point, DHS is the best funded agency of all the federal law enforcement agencies, we are going to be asking for an audit. I want to know why that agency has been ill-equipped or unwilling or unable to change the way that it engages on the border. Mm -hmm. The way that DHS is engaging today, after almost five years of Central American uh, asylum seekers coming to our front door, it's engaging in the same way today as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even after we provided as Americans a significant amount of money. And we want answers about separated children as well. Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, thank you. Evelyn Farkas, thank you as well. Jeremy and Kurt will be bringing you back a little later. I want to know when we're going to see the president's tax returns. <laughs> so we'll hold that, that answer for you. Look into that. Still ahead, we'll show you the moment a Republican congressman tried to turn a hearing about gun violence into a debate about a border wall. And the fathers whose children were murdered in gun attacks who weren't having it. Morning Joe will be right back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.